Welcome to Mad Men Deconstructed. This is Season 1, Episode 13, The Wheel. The word nostalgia comes from the Greek words nostos, meaning homecoming, and algos, meaning ache. A Swiss medical student first used the term in 1688 to describe Swiss mercenaries who longed for home. The word appears in Sir Joseph Banks' journal of the voyage of the HMS Endeavour, who on September 3, 1770 wrote, The sailors are now pretty far gone with longing for home, which the physicians have gone so far as to esteem a disease under the name of nostalgia. Initially diagnosed as a medical condition, nostalgia became increasingly linked to romanticism in art throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. Forbidden among soldiers, the Swiss song Karehin became a symbol of their melancholy. This mal de Suisse became the subject of romantic poems, and even an 1834 opera, Le Chalet, by Adolf Charles Adam. We now view nostalgia as a powerful, motivating emotion. We experience this feeling often, triggered by familiar music, old photographs, or even places from our past. Nostalgia can improve our mood and heighten positive emotions when we deal with negative feelings. It's been shown to enhance positive self-worth. Reflecting on past relationships increases our sense of social support and helps us connect with the world. The advertising industry often exploits nostalgia as a marketing tool. Ads reference familiar images, music, or phrases to evoke a feeling that connects consumers and products. It's the approach Don voices in the pilot when he says, Advertising is based on one thing, happiness. Throughout Mad Men, we'll see Don striving to tell stories, to evoke feelings, all for the sake of selling products. And Mad Men's 13th episode, The Wheel, is perhaps its most charming example. The season one finale occurs the week of Thanksgiving, 1960, just weeks after the year's momentous presidential election. It's a somber episode that deals with themes of family, underscored by the twinge of sentimentality a yearning for connection, and for the comfort of our loved ones. The Wheel was written by Matthew Weiner and Robin Vaith. It was the series' first episode directed by Matthew Weiner. The Wheel would eventually appear at the 2008 Emmys when Mad Men won the award for Outstanding Drama Series. It remains IMDb's most highly rated episode of season one. It's a fitting conclusion to Mad Men's first season, one filled with emotional subtext and with callbacks to the show's beginnings, an episode about work, about family, about regret. Pete Campbell sits in his Manhattan apartment about two weeks after the November 8th election. Remember that our last episode, Nixon vs. Kennedy, ended with Pete's unsuccessful attempt at blackmail. Trudy's father, Tom Vogel, remarks on the election. He claims Nixon didn't have a chance. He sits on the sofa and offers Pete some fatherly advice. Focus less on work. Tend your own garden. The only family and business you should be mixing is the production of a child. Dawn and Betty argue over their Thanksgiving plans. She's taking the children to her father's house for the holiday and outlines what they'll need to bring along. Dawn says he can't go, explaining that his new responsibilities as a partner won't allow him to take time off. He asks if the family can celebrate at home. Betty's frustration boils over. I don't understand why you can't make my family your family, she says. A close-up shows Harry on the phone in the darkness. As the shot pulls away, we see him sitting at his desk, wearing a plain white t-shirt. He pleads with his wife to let him come home, insisting that having sex with Hildy didn't mean anything. But Harry's wife denies him, and he settles in for the night. These beginning scenes are the bullet points to the wheel's core ideas about work and family life, and it foreshadows how Mad Men will contrast these guys throughout the episode. Pete's still preoccupied with Sterling Cooper, and feels pressured by his increasingly present in-laws. Harry faces the consequences of the election night and of his honesty, and Don, miserable in his marriage, uses work as an escape. Betty returns from the supermarket the following morning and finds Francine at her door, distraught. Francine sits in the living room, her hair and outfit a mess. She tells Betty how she noticed countless phone calls to Manhattan on her phone bill. Betty sits in denial as Francine explains that she called the Manhattan number, that another woman answered the phone. What woman? 
would he be calling in Manhattan? Who answers her own phone? <laughs> Married women. Lots of women answer their own phones. So he's calling some married woman from my house while I'm upstairs sleeping? Maybe it's a caterer, or maybe he's throwing you a surprise party. <laughs> Betty says that Francine is emotional, that she's assuming the worst, but Francine claims she knows everything. Her husband Carlton spends two nights a week at the Waldorf in Manhattan. The affair has been happening right in front of her. I'm going to have a house full of people. I'll poison them all. His parents. My parents. My kids. Stop it. Stop that, Francine. Betty continues to deny Francine's accusations, suggesting she should just forget it. Francine stops her, hysterical and in disbelief. You're emotional. It doesn't mean... Damn it, Betty. I know everything. What am I going to do? I've been sitting outside in the car. What do I What do? I, do? I thought you'd know what to do. Me? I, why? I don't know. I find this scene powerful and visually striking. The film crew develops a contrast of blue and yellow throughout several shots of Betty's living room, where she sits on a gold couch with gold-colored walls, her blonde hair trimmed to her shoulders. She wears a pale blue sweater and a royal blue overcoat. The hallway behind her is painted blue. Francine seems almost hopeless in her crisis. She asserts many of the concerns of married life. Her husband is rarely home. He spends much of his time alone. But in voicing her accusations, Francine realizes that she's known about Carlton's infidelity all along. Marital age fell steadily throughout the early 20th century, reaching a low around 1960 when the median bride was just 20 years old. Couples were young. Like Don and Betty, many married couples didn't really know each other. Families had begun moving to the suburbs, and husbands often spent long hours at work, away from their wives. The United States led the world in divorces by 1916. Some couples divorced secretly in foreign countries like Mexico or Haiti, while others found ways to exploit the U.S. legal system. Divorce law was governed by individual states. Reno was considered a destination for divorce seekers. The state of Nevada required a temporary residency of at least six weeks. Much of Reno's tourism industry was built to entertain these temporary residents. But despite some states' reputation for leniency, divorce was still considered socially taboo and against the public interest. Many civil courts refused to grant a legal divorce without proof of a fault, such as abandonment, cruelty, or adultery. As residents of the state of New York, Betty and Francine would need to prove adultery. The National Association of Women Lawyers began to push reforms, like the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act, around 1960. But it was not until 1969 that California passed the U.S.'s first no-fault divorce law. In addition to these legal challenges, many women depended on their husbands to provide income, Mad Men notably portrayed the burden of single parenthood in Marriage of Figaro and New Amsterdam. Betty and Francine pity Helen Bishop throughout many of their conversations. So despite increasing whispers of divorce, I don't think Betty or Francine viewed separation as an option in 1960. This is probably Francine's best scene in the Mad Men series. She enters crying, visibly shaken, but builds to the point of rage. Francine's crisis really helps us understand the depths of Betty's denial. Betty worked so hard to maintain the image of an outwardly perfect life, but this scene shows how other characters can see through that facade, and Betty's protestations seem less driven by real emotion than by a desire to keep up the appearance of perfection. She doesn't want to believe in cruelty. Betty embraces Francine on the couch one last time. He doesn't know that you know, Betty says. The Draper's new maid, Carla, arrives. Francine leaves, and Betty walks into Don's study. She finds a sealed phone bill, hesitating for a second before she slips it into her pocket and walks out. Duck Phillips calls a meeting in Sterling Cooper's conference room. The framing of this scene heavily recalls the traffic meeting in 5G, with Duck assuming Roger's position in the center of the frame. Duck's tone is almost autocratic. He hands out a list of potential clients and offers a bonus for bringing in new business. People want cars. They want to fly, Duck says. He mentions an upcoming meeting with Kodak. Don arrives home that evening and finds Betty sitting alone at the kitchen table. 
He sits as she tells him about Francine's marital trouble. I'm surprised she told you, Don says. She's like a sister to me, Betty responds. Betty's denial starts to break down in this scene. She finds some inner anger, startling Don, who struggles for an explanation. How could someone do that to the person that they love? That they have children with? Doesn't this all mean anything? Who knows why people do what they do? Ken and Peggy sit in a recording booth the following day. They watch as three women audition for a radio commercial about the relaxicizer. One of these ladies was actually a writer's assistant on the show. She's quickly eliminated. Ken prefers the older actress, named Rita, but Peggy asserts herself and chooses a younger, vibrant girl named Annie. Annie stands opposite the glass window of the recording studio. She smiles and reads Peggy's copy about the relaxicizer. Give her a direction, Ken says, as Peggy complains about the actress's lack of confidence. Annie reads the lines over and over, searching for the right tone, but Peggy isn't satisfied. I swear, he looks at me like the night- Annie. Annie. You're married. Maybe you put on a few pounds, but then you got the relaxicizer, and you're back to being you. Right now. I don't know that I understand. Annie, what don't you understand? I am being me. A tear falls down her face as Annie struggles with Peggy's direction. After several attempts, Peggy fires her. She admits that Ken's instincts were right. In this order, I want you to go after her and console her. And after you make plans or whatever you need to do, call Rita. The older lady you liked? She's probably home with the relaxicizer right now. Ken pats her on the head as he leaves. It's another reminder of how desexualized Peggy has become. The story behind her weight gain was kept secret. Many of actress Elizabeth Moss's friends expressed concern. Actor John Slattery saw Moss on set and asked if she was pregnant. But Peggy doesn't seem bothered by her weight, growing in confidence as the season progresses. The audition scene creates a striking contrast between the actress, physically beautiful but full of self-doubt, and Peggy, decisive and confident. It seems like Mad Men is hinting at the idea of beauty as a symptom of vanity, and I think this can be tied to Betty Draper, another woman repeatedly fawned over for her beauty. Like the actress, Betty also struggles with self-doubt. The cinematography in this audition is some of my favorite from season one. There's a moody feeling throughout the scene, with a lot of underexposed shots. Ken and Peggy sit in the darkness, the background black behind them. Peggy utters cues into the mic as the actress's reflection looks on in the glass window. Then the actress reads lines while Ken's reflection observes from the other side. The scene's climax is a really intimate close-up of Annie crying, upset and alone. Meanwhile, Doc walks into Don's office with Kodak's new slide projector. A black plastic disc sits atop the large projector box. Doc calls it a donut and explains the purpose. It's continuous and doesn't jam. Don jokes that Kodak has reinvented the wheel. Pete lays in bed with Trudy that night. He's worried about having a child. Pete says he doesn't make enough money to provide for a family. Trudy reassures him, telling him they'll find a way to make ends meet. But Pete again senses an opportunity. He asks Trudy for help at work. Her father's an executive at Vic's Pharmaceutical. Pete implies he'll focus on his family if Trudy can get him a piece of Vic's business. It seems like another case of Pete misplacing his energy on work. Night falls as Don sits in his office looking at projector slides under the light of his desk lamp. He pulls Adam's shoebox from the drawer and looks at a photograph from 1944. In the photo, Don sits on a horse with Adam by his side. Don pauses for a moment to stare at the picture. He grabs the phone and dials the Brighton Hotel, where he last left Adam in 5G. The hotel manager hesitates for a moment before breaking the news. Jesus, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but he hung himself. Adam Whitman was introduced in episode 5. He appeared as a newborn in episode 6, Babylon, then again in Indian Summer and in Nixon vs. Kennedy. Adam chasing after his brother on the train platform is one of season 1's most heart-wrenching moments. Adam's reappearance pains Don. It forces Don to remember the brother he abandoned. Mad Men shows this specific photograph several times in season 1. I've thought about this a bit and I've concluded that the show uses the photo to establish a deeper bond between the Whitman brothers. Adam is Don's only blood relative 
the only Mad Men character with connections to Don's troubled childhood. We see the depth of this bond in 5G's cafe scene. Did you miss me at all? Of course I did. Don eventually abandons Adam a second time, leaving his brother with nothing but $5,000. The hotel manager mentions that Adam willed Don's money to the building. Mad Men is undoubtedly conveying the dehumanizing power of materialism here. Adam didn't want Don's money. He sought a human connection, sought brotherhood. In 5G, Don justifies his detachment, declaring he must move forward with his life. And in his speech, we see Mad Men's narrative power of misdirection. We think Don's choice is about maintaining his new family and identity, but it's really about the pain Don associates with leaving his brother on that train platform. Mad Men hints at Don's inner flaws long before it introduces Adam Whitman to the story, but Adam's introduction leaves Don fundamentally shaken. I view 5G as a sort of turning point in Don's season 1 arc. It's the moment that teases out his unsettled inner conflicts, the moment when his inner identity starts to terrorize his crafted stoicism. We see this in subsequent episodes, in the cafe in Babylon, at the party at Midge's apartment in the Hobo Code, and in the final scene of Long Weekend. If Nixon vs. Kennedy is Don's climactic short-term triumph, then the wheel is the beginning of his long-winded tragedy. Burt's memorable line, Who cares? seems to declare that Don's big lie is inconsequential. It deflates the built-up suspense around Don's identity. But the wheel makes a different statement. Don's story may not doom him professionally. His past may not matter at Sterling Cooper, but it's destroying his personal relationships, leaving him isolated and alone. Don hangs up the phone distraught. He puts his head in his hands and weeps, a cigarette dangling between his fingertips, the dim light of his table lamp illuminating him against the partially open blinds of his office window. A plaque rests on the ledge behind him, reminding us how Adam entered our story after finding Don's picture in an article about an advertising award. About Adam, we can recall Don's words from the pilot, you're born alone and you die alone, and this world just drops a bunch of rules on you to make you forget this basic fact. It's a brutal rephrasing of a famous, more hopeful quote from Orson Welles. We're born alone, we live alone, we die alone. Only through our love and friendship can we create the illusion for the moment that we're not alone. Betty lays restlessly in the dark of her bedroom. She is alone again, sleepless and preoccupied with Don's secrecy. She grabs the phone bill, opens the envelope, and notices several calls to Manhattan. Betty sits cross-legged in the hallway, her hair unkempt, a phone in one hand, a cigarette in the other. It's a childish pose, but her expressions seem resolute. A few rings elapse before a man's voice answers. Who is this? Betty asks, relieved. This is Dr. Arnold Wayne, the voice answers. Her fear turns to shock as Dr. Wayne mistakes her for another patient. She realizes that Don has been colluding with her psychiatrist. Remember in Long Weekend when Joan mentions the 1960 film Midnight Lace? Midnight Lace portrays its protagonist Kit Preston, played by actress Doris Day, gaslit by her husband and psychiatrist. Mad Men incorporates several of the movie's ideas in Betty's story. She's visually similar to Kit Preston, fashionably dressed with short blonde hair. Much like Kit's husband, Don is neglectful, unfaithful. It's late into the night and Harry walks through the office, smoke rising from the trash can he carries in both hands. Matthew Weiner has stated that he wanted to show this at some point because many people did set their trash bins on fire. Don notices Harry and calls to him. Harry jogs over to Don's office, wearing only a white t-shirt and his white underwear. Don's clearly been drinking after the news of Adam's suicide, drinking so he doesn't have to feel. We expect him to talk about something personal, but he instead points to the projector wheel and asks, what is the point of that thing? I think this scene has some beautiful transformative subtext. Don's just been rattled by his brother's death. He associates photographs with memories and remembering is painful for Don. But Harry brings up his own past as a photographer. He describes a set of photos he shot in college, handprints on glass. Harry says he was inspired by cave paintings at Peshmerel, a cave in southwestern France. It was like someone was reaching through the stone to say, I was here. Harry's story seems to move Don. It reminds Don about human connection, about the power of memory in creating feelings of comfort and permanence, and it suggests to Don that perhaps pain is rooted in something deeper, more profound, in memory, in fondness. We should point out that Mad Men's future seasons were unconfirmed when the wheel was filmed. Rumors swirled among cast members. One of the characters might be written out. 
Rampant speculation centered around Harry Crane, with some thinking he might jump out of the building. But Mad Men found a way to keep Harry around, and the wheel presents Harry at his best. Honest, empathetic, sentimental, expressing genuine remorse that sparks change in Dawn. Their shared loneliness helps both men realize the importance of family. The scene continues to develop a contrast between men and women. This era's men show a strong sense of camaraderie. They form deep friendships. They support one another. Mad Men's women, meanwhile, are very lonely, leading very different lives, unable to relate to each other. Betty is the most obvious example of this, but even Peggy and Joan, surrounded by other women, have few friends. Harry leaves Don's office and Don falls asleep on his sofa. His white shirt fades into a snow-covered parking lot as Betty pulls up to the bank. This scene was filmed in Pasadena on one of the hottest days of summer. The snow was added through CGI. The actors wore ice packs under their winter clothing. Betty notices Helen's green Volkswagen parked outside the bank. Helen's leading many of the 1960s developing trends, including single parenthood, hero-like worship for JFK, and even her car. Betty walks over and finds Helen's son, Glenn, alone in the car. I'm not supposed to talk to you, he says nervously. Betty says she doesn't care. Glenn, I can't talk to anyone. It's so horrible. I'm so sad. He offers Betty his hand through the window. She begins to cry. cry. Please. Please tell me I'll be okay. I don't know. I wish I was older. Oh, adults don't know anything, Glenn. Mad Men has spent much of season one establishing Betty's immaturity. Glenn seems mature despite his youth, perhaps the result of being raised by a single mother. They're psychologically the same age, and Betty turns to him when she realizes she has nobody else. It's the first time Betty directly vocalizes her feelings. Glenn reminds her that his mother might come out soon. She turns away sobbing and walks to her car. Pete walks into Don's office that afternoon with some good news. He signed Clearasil. That's a real account, Don praises. Pete mentions that Cooper gave him a bonus and a copy of Atlas Shrugged. Self-worth and status. You said it, Pete reminds Don. We see Peggy typing copy through Don's open office door. The wheel does well to re-establish Pete at Sterling Cooper. It would be easy for us to view the previous episode as Pete's demise, but Mad Men had a longer story in mind for Pete. The wheel opens at his apartment, and throughout the episode, Pete shows perhaps his most identifiable quality opportunism. Pete recognizes his chances to solidify his place at the agency, using his personal connections to bring in his father-in-law as a client. It's diametrically opposite of what we'd expect from someone like Don or Peggy, and though Don seems annoyed by Pete's continued luck, he can't argue with the results. We're reminded of what Cooper instructed in Nixon vs. Kennedy, put your energy into bringing in accounts. Pete's success at work creates new problems at home, though. He's now professionally tied to his father-in-law, who aggressively pushes him to have a child. Pete hesitates to put down roots. He doesn't seem to respect Trudy's father, a nouveau riche man without the reputation or manners to go with his money. Despite this, Pete's job is now inexorably tied to Tom Vogel. The next scene shows Betty with her psychiatrist. She wears all gray and lays confidently on Dr. Wayne's sofa. Betty's monologue lasted over six minutes on set, but was eventually cut down to about half. Actress January Jones mentions that this was her most challenging scene. She listened to her lines in an earpiece to memorize them for filming. Betty begins about family, discussing her Thanksgiving plans and remembering her late mother. She expresses gratitude, saying Dr. Wayne's therapy has helped. But her tone quickly changes, and she lays her accusations openly. Still, uh, I can't help but think that I would be happy if my husband was faithful to me. Betty continues as Dr. Wayne writes furiously. She talks about how Don's cruelty is right in her face, how he comes home late and smells like other women. She speculates that Don doesn't understand marriage and family. He doesn't know what family is. 
doesn't even have one. It makes me sorry for him. When in fact I... I should be angry. Very angry, you know? That I put up with it like some ostrich. Betty shoots Dr. Wayne an accusing glance as she moves to light a cigarette. She calmly concludes, maybe it's not me, maybe it's him. This is Betty's most compelling scene in season one. It shows her finally acknowledge Don's affairs, confronting her feelings openly, and even finding enough resolution to pity Don. Betty knows her words will reach Don. This is how she can finally reach through to him. And Betty's words do seem to reach Don. He stands in the conference room with two men from Kodak and several more from Sterling Cooper, delivering a deeply personal pitch for the projector. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards and forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. Don stares at the slides on the screen, photos of his own memories, first him with his daughter Sally, then with newborn Bobby, then with Betty on their wedding day. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. It let's us travel the way a child travels. Around and around, and back home again. place where we know we are loved. The projector clicks through its last slide, an image of Don and Betty at midnight on New Year's Eve, 1956. Harry hurries out of the room sobbing. The men from Kodak are stunned. Good luck at your next meeting, says Duck. Mad Men had garnered critical acclaim before this episode, but this pitch made it a cultural phenomenon. It's one of the show's most recognizable moments as Don pulls from his recent emotional trauma to appeal to consumer sentimentality. As he looks at the slides, Don seems to realize how much he cherishes his own family. They're a source of tranquility among his other, often painful, memories. But despite its emotional upheaval, the pitch is littered with irony. The life Don portrays isn't anything like his own. He's selling an American dream, success, family, but it's just a dream. Don's own life isn't fulfilling. The wife and family he sentimentalizes haven't brought him happiness. We've seen this already in episode 10, Long Weekend, when Roger asks, Is this all that's left for me? Don's pitch was written months in advance of the episode, the product unknown at that time. He explains the word nostalgia in Greek, an idea borrowed from Peggy's pitch in Indian Summer. Actor John Hamm is actually looking at a blank projector screen throughout the scene. The cast took hundreds of photographs, but they were added during post-production. Duck arrives at Don's office, followed by Pete, Ken, Paul, and Sal. Kodak canceled their other meetings, he says. They pour drinks to celebrate, but Duck abstains. Here's how, Ken toasts. Feeling empowered, Don declares that Peggy will write copy for Clearasil. Pete laughs at first, but grows outraged when he realizes Don is serious. Don invites Peggy into his office. You are now a junior copywriter, he says. She shakes his still swollen hand and promises to do her best. Joan shows Peggy to a shared copywriter's office. They meet another writer, Victor Manny, who was never seen in the series after this episode. Joan tells Peggy to remember her humble beginnings, but Peggy's crippled by a side-splitting pain and leaves early to see a doctor. Dr. Oliver examines Peggy in the emergency room. You didn't mention you were expecting, he says. Peggy is shocked and in denial. That's not possible, she insists. She gets up to leave but falls to the floor in pain. Peggy wakes in the low light of a hospital room. A nurse enters holding a swaddled baby boy. She brings the newborn to Peggy. Don't you want to hold him? She asks. Peggy looks at the baby for a moment, then turns her head away. Pete stumbles into his apartment that night, startling Trudy and his in-laws. Trudy notices that he's drunk. He says he'll lay down, drops his jacket on the floor behind him, and walks away. Tom Vogel cracks another joke about Pete making a baby. We've waited for 12 episodes and nearly 9 months since Peggy and Pete's final scene in Mad Men's pilot. These are the consequences. Peggy has been pregnant. 
She ignored the warnings about birth control and ignored her physical symptoms. And she's now given birth to a child, Pete's child, one for whom his father-in-law so desperately hopes. But Peggy doesn't want a child. She rejects her mistake. Elements of Dawn are woven throughout Pete and Peggy's stories. This moment is no exception. Pete's hesitance to start a family seems in some way borrowed from Dawn's distant behavior. Despite Dawn's warnings, Pete imitates his destructive character flaws. Peggy isn't faultless either. She doesn't hold the child, doesn't even cry. Mad Men established this in Peggy's character as early as episode 2, Ladies Room. She's resolute, often in denial, and in the wheel, she coldly disavows the child, leaving it without a mother. It reminds us of Don, of his adopted parents, of his unloved youth. Don rides a train full of travelers eager for Thanksgiving. Some laugh, others carry gifts, but Don sits alone, deep in thought. He arrives at home and closes the front door behind him. Betty and the kids are packing for the weekend. I'm coming with you, Don says. Betty smiles, and the kids scream with joy. But Don's entry repeats, and we realize that the previous scene was a daydream. He calls out for his kids, for his wife, but his voice echoes through the empty house as he stands in the doorway. He moves to the staircase, a close-up shot showing the deep grief on his face. He sits alone as the camera pulls away and around a corner. The music of Bob Dylan's Don't Think Twice, It's All Right plays as the episode and Mad Men's first season fade to credits. The Wheel is season one's finale, a reflective story about time, family, and regret. It's recognizable for Don's pitch and Peggy's pregnancy, but I think fans can see this episode as the beginning of the long denouement to Nixon vs. Kennedy's climax. The Wheel has powerful moments of its own, but those moments often prompt questions rather than offering answers. Betty's development has been slow, even frustrating to witness. She's victimized throughout season one and seems incapable of standing up for herself. But the wheel shows her finally acknowledging Don's infidelity and laying her veiled accusations through Dr. Wayne. It's not a total transformation for Betty, though, and we sense that her innocent demeanor is something that can't coexist with Don's abrasive selfishness. The wheel offers, in my opinion, season one's most thoughtful portrayal of the lives of men and women. Sterling Cooper is the setting for friendships, for excess and hedonism, but while its ad men carouse at the office, Mad Men's women linger at home, alone and repressed. Betty and Francine have no one to confide in, no one to turn to for help. Even Betty's psychiatrist is deceitful. She's left to befriend a nine-year-old boy. We sense throughout Mad Men's finale that Don realizes the importance of family. He's recently dealt with the emotional trauma of being exposed at work, and he learns of his brother's suicide while working late one night. That powerful nostalgia Don evokes in his pitch is something he seems to pull from within himself. Family is Don's source of permanence, of belonging. The episode's final scenes hint at a possible reconciliation between Betty and Don. But that reconciliation won't happen the way Don imagines, and the wheel's ending reminds us that Don's failures will have consequences. He's left disappointed and alone, sitting on the staircase of an empty home. Don's been the focus of Mad Men throughout season one, it's perhaps the most thorough treatment of his character across the show's seven seasons. I think his arc embodies one of the show's central themes about desire and expectations, that our dreams aren't always what we expect, that our aspirations may not bring us peace. It reminds me of an idea from HBO's True Detective. We all have what I call a life trap, a genuine certainty that things will be different, that you'll fall in love and be fulfilled, the ontological fallacy of a light at the end of the tunnel. Don shows us these relatable impulses of aspiration and achievement. It's the same new is better concept he mentions to begin the carousel pitch. I think this is human nature. A new car can captivate us, and we feel a thrill when we take it for the first drive. But after a few weeks, or months, that new car is just our car. Don often voices the idea that his life moves in one direction, forward. But the wheel hints that he's fallen into a cycle of wanting, achieving, and growing bored. Though he momentarily realizes the importance of his family, we wonder how long any reconciliation will keep Don fulfilled. Time and repetition are prominent themes in the wheel. The episode offers multiple callbacks to Mad Men's pilot, even in small moments like the dissolve of Don lying on his office sofa, or Joan leading Peggy through the office. The Sterling Cooper boys rush into Don's office for another celebration. Don exacts some more revenge on Pete. Remember when Peggy tried to make a move on Don after her first day at Sterling Cooper? Peggy again reaches for Don's hand in the wheel, though this time under far different circumstances. Even Don's dream sequence mirrors the emotional tone of the pilot's closing scene, 
a hopeful moment with his family. The season's final shot evokes its first, with Don sitting contemplatively, alone, adrift in his own problems. The wheel, to me, represents Peggy's uplifting triumph. Mad Men portrays her resolve throughout the episode, as she earns a promotion and finds her place at Sterling Cooper. Peggy is Mad Men's most redeemable character. She encounters a culture that rejects her talent, but Peggy's success is Mad Men's hopeful response, that in the end, Peggy's good ideas will drive her career forward. Some fans may criticize Peggy's decision to give up her baby. The moment continues to spark controversy. But to me, this is the final step of Peggy's character growth that began in Mad Men's pilot. The baby represents a life she could have accepted, one of misogyny and hardship. It embodies that insecure desire to belong that led Peggy to sleep with Pete. And by giving the baby away, Peggy makes a choice, to reject her insecurities, to reject society's views about women and work. This is Peggy's final assertion, that she controls her fate, that she belongs in the world of advertising. But Peggy doesn't leave season one without scars. Her pregnancy has transformed her, imbuing her with a self-assuredness we'll see in future seasons. She'll become direct, at times emotionally detached, and her abandonment will haunt her throughout the series. Her relationship with Pete is far from over. Mad Men won critical acclaim for its opening season. Matthew Weiner's period piece was awarded the Emmy Award for Outstanding Drama Series, the Golden Globe for Best Drama Series, and even a Peabody Award. The show captivated us with its style, in homage to a decade over 50 years gone. It hinted at the social movements that would define a generation. But for all of its 1960s pageantry, for all its plaid suits and pompadours, Mad Men's themes remain timeless. The show's search for belonging feels familiar, even a decade after its premiere. It's at times charming, at times hopeful, even sad. I introduced this episode by discussing nostalgia as a sort of homesickness. And that's the feeling I get from Mad Men's first season, one that compelled me through its layered characters. Season 1 feels like the moment you met your best friend. This is Mad Men at its most focused, presenting a story centered on Don Draper. The scope will grow from here as Mad Men explores other characters, Roger, Joan, Peggy, Pete, and the show will grow in style, depth, and narrative risk-taking. But we can always look back to season one, Mad Men's sentimental introduction, to remember how things began. My next few episodes will recap some of the narrative elements I found noteworthy throughout my work on season one. These will release as bonus episodes, around 15 to 20 minutes each, and look at the season a bit more comprehensively. And that will conclude season one, Mad Men's introduction, and the year 1960. But don't worry, there are still six seasons of Mad Men and a decade of cultural upheaval to discuss. And unlike the wheel, we're moving forward to season two for those who think young. Hey everyone, I wanted to share a few quick announcements to wrap up the show. Number one, you may have noticed, but I've created some new episode art exclusively for season one. Number two, I've set up social media accounts that are linked in the episode description. You can now find me on Instagram and YouTube, where I'll release more Mad Men content. And finally, number three, I really appreciate your feedback and encourage you to like and comment on my episodes, and please subscribe to the podcast so you know when new content arrives. As always, you can reach out to me with any questions or comments. My email address is madmendeconstructedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and see you next episode.